Bob and Amy, for those of you watching right now online through our Facebook page or those who will watch later on YouTube, it's because of Bob and Amy's dedication every Sunday to transmit this service to our online community. So please give those guys a round of applause because that is some great, great service. And certainly welcome back to uh, Reverend Don and Ann. So I am un I'm consciously uncoupling from my past. Perhaps some of you are as well. And it actually started a couple of years ago uh, with my possessions, definitely fueled by my mom's transition and the work that I and my family had to do with her possessions and my father's possessions. And you spend a year going through another person's possessions and it, well, I can say, I can't speak for you, but I can say for myself, having gone through that experience for over a year, it radically changed my relationship to stuff. So when I first came back to Alaska in 2020, I basically gave away 80% of my things. A lot of that was because I was in deep grief, but a lot of it was also because I was so radically changed and I was a completely different person than the person that went on that trip and saw that item and had immediate connection with it and bought it and brought it home and put it on a shelf and looked at it with meaning, right? So it wasn't that these items weren't uh, meaningful. It was just that I no longer was the person who felt that meaningfulness with that item. And as a result, I got rid of a lot of things. I actually didn't realize how many things I got rid of until the following year, last year, right at this time when I came home for the first time, really, to re-enter my home in a full-time way. And I, I didn't have furniture or a bed. Uh, I didn't have, I walked in, I felt like I had just bought my, my condo because it was empty. But there was something very um, powerful about that emptiness. Because I knew something had ended, and I knew I was making way for something that I didn't quite know yet what it would be kind of like a blank canvas and you have the paints and the paintbrush, but the, the picture has not yet emerged. So from there, it went on to clothing. Now, I, I don't know what it is. It, it, I'll tell you, I actually do know what it is. It's the mind. It's the untrained mind. What else could it be that could look at a top or a blouse that's clearly two sizes smaller than I will ever, ever again fit into, <laughs> but yet, while I'm holding it, that mind will go, you know, you might, you might fit into that one day. You should keep it. And I, back into the closet it goes. It's like, that's insane. So I don't do that. I don't do that anymore. In fact, when my mind says that, that is the, you know, the sign to put it in the donation pile. But that is certainly something I imagine we all can relate to. Then it was the photos, right? Not too long ago. We had cameras, and the only thing in the camera was the film that had the picture, right? Now we just take it for granted that our phone is a camera, and it holds all the pictures, and we can just look at it anytime we want to. It's like, wow, that's pretty wild. But I'll always be a fan of the photo. There's just something about these rituals that we had and still have. But I had to do something with the enormous collection of photos I've had. So my first choice was, OK, if it's a, if it's a landscape, if it has no people in it, I'm going to get rid of those. And that definitely cut down the amount of photos that I had. Then it was the books. I, I am not by nature a voracious reader. Um, you know, my collection tends to be in you know albums and CDs and cassettes and all things music. But I did notice as I was going through my books that the one topic that I have the most books in, of course, is metaphysics. And the one author that I have the most books from is, of course, my guru, my main guy, Ernest Holmes. And it was really interesting because as I was as I was asked to talk this week, all of this was happening, you know, and I was dabbling back in the books and 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 even my spiritual education that was taking up an awful lot of space. I mean, I had like 18 three ring binders. <laughs> I thought, all right, wait a second, right? So I thought, okay, we'll take them out of the binders and reduce it to this pack of papers. 
and you know, I think in my harshest moments, I looked at that pile and I was like, let's burn it, you know, let's, let's, let's get rid of this. What are you gonna do, stop awakening so that you can go back and remember what you were like when you first awakened? You know, it was very, very interesting. But I realized that those papers contain the history of my awakening. And if I were to sit and read them, and I did pull a few and brought tears to my eyes to connect with that Camille who was awakening to something she had never ever known before. It would be quite, quite the trajectory of, of not only my spiritual awakening but my maturity for sure because I have stained the evolution of my consciousness on those papers and that's the gift that spiritual education gives us. So for now the papers remain. So Again, as I was asked to speak today, I'm in all this and I'm realizing, wow, this philosophy is a hundred years old. I mean, how many things even last a hundred years, let alone are still usable, even better than they were when they were first created as this philosophy. And that's why today I, I am having uh, my own version of Memorial Day, like tomorrow, we take time in reverence and in gratitude and in thoughtfulness, in ritual and in service to remember those who gave their lives in, in the way of war and those veterans that still today have given an aspect of their lives that maybe they'll never get back again for the freedoms that we enjoy. And that got me thinking about those people who have given their lives for this philosophy, right? Those people who gave their lives and dedicated their lives to this philosophy that is based on principle so that you and I can still be here gathered on a Sunday to talk about it and as Reverend Don said to remember you know to renew and to give thanks and have reverence for those that came before us so that is my that is my hope today um, I'm particularly grateful um, you know we've been around for a while we are not the new kids on the block. We've taken up space in this community for over 40 years. And you know, if you've been around long enough, you know the story that my friend Deb Carlson for a whole year invited me to church, you know, and no, <laughs> even though this is the sign of the cross, it was like, no, back off, I'm never going, you know, to church. Um, but she was so persistent, and thank goodness she was. Because finally I looked her right in the eye and I said, you're just not going to stop, are you, until I go. She said, you're finally catching on. <laughs> and so I went and we were downtown on A Street in the, what is now the piano place. And we were, went down there and that was that, right? There she was, the glorious Reverend Nancy Sweeney, who completely turned my religious life upside down. A woman? Where was I? What? Right? And that day, she actually cursed from the podium. I mean, I'm telling you, for the first time, I mean, I, was, I walked out of there, I was like, you know that guy in the, in the stereo commercial that's sitting in the chair and everything is blown back? I left there just like that, like, what just happened? It was just, but they were also glorious, glorious years, because we were in something new. And of course, her husband, Jerry, and, and Becky, and they were so dedicated to it. And it was just, just a, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful time. So I give thanks to all of those who have come before me, those who are still alive, like to every single person that's ever prayed me up, prayed me a life. Like, wow. You know, that's the truth about the science of mind and spirit for me is that it not only saved my life, but it gave me a life. That's the power of this philosophy for you today if you haven't already had that kind of an experience. And I do call it the science of mind and spirit because Ernest initially had that title and I, I wish they didn't give it up, right? Because we were ahead of the curve. They were ahead of the curve. I mean, you got to understand these new thought leaders at the turn of the century, they were being called blasphemous by the church because they had the guts and the courage and the willingness to think outside the box. And that's what this philosophy gave us. It gave us a new way of thinking about God, a new way of thinking about ourselves as divine beings, a new way of understanding life, 
a new way of understanding each other and our relationship to each other and all things. Just pretty amazing how many people and they all loved each other and they all hung out together. I mean, who went over here, you know, uh, Myrtle and Charles Fillmore and they created divine science and, you know, they all went and did their thing. They were never in competition with each other because there was enough truth for everybody, but it went through each of their consciousness in a unique way. And that's why we had divine science. And now, you know, you have all these people who are talking about science and spirituality as if it's a new, a new discovery, but it's not. It's been around for a really long time. So I wanted to also talk a little bit about Ernest Holmes. It, this thing is awake, aware, and alive. It's active. It's right here, right now. It's a presence. It's, it's the thing we hear, the small voice, the loud voice. It, it's right where we are. It's, a, it's an awake, aware presence. And it was very awake uh, last night because I thought, well, let me pull in some of these books and, you know, and see, see what, what I have. And, and uh, the, one of the first books I pulled out was the story of Ernest Holmes and the religious science movement. Because I got really into Ernest Holmes and I read every book they had written about him. And I've given talks even about yeah. Ernest Holmes because his life is really fascinating. Plus, I just really relate to Ernest Holmes because he was an entertainer. He loved, he was hanging out in California and all like Peggy Lee and all these, you know, Hollywood greats. They knew Ernest Holmes. They went to his Sunday uh, services at the theater, and they were his clients as he was their practitioner. So he loved he loved the movers and the shakers, and he was one himself. And so I grabbed this book. I said, and I did one of those random opens, and of course, this is what it said. The study of the science of mind is the study of original first cause. Now, when I started uh, on my path, first cause was a phrase that took me a very long time to embrace and understand. Like, I had never heard of God talked about as first cause. I didn't know what he was talking about, but I didn't give up, but I'm glad I never did. That ultimate stuff from which all things are made, the thing itself, Man has called it by many names throughout recorded history, but the name is unimportant. Universal principles are not respecters of persons. Heaven has no favorites. Dun, 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 right? <laughs> like, wow, what? You know, you were either repulsed by that and walked away, or you walked right towards that and said, tell me more. You know, kind of like Prince. Like when Prince first came on the scene, you were either like, oh, no, this is too much. I don't understand it. <laughs> or you were like, I'm going to follow this guy for the rest of my life. So that's how he spoke about it. That's how he spoke about it. He believed that it was really important to stay open at the top. You know, he understood this was a philosophy. He also understood that philosophies were meant to be challenged. One of the great things he said early on that I took very, very seriously was he said, I don't want you to memorize my words and then go out and repeat them. Because you see, he grew up in religion and he grew up in church and there's that famous story about how one time they went to church and the preacher was you know talking about fire and brimstone and you're all going to hell and you're all sinners and they came home in their buggy or whatever and the father pulled over and turned around to all the kids and said don't believe a word that guy said that is not the truth you know turned around and drove the horses home like wow right that kid was destined for something this great to have had a father who said that to him after going to a service that diminished them to dirt. Incredible. So he always said, don't memorize my words. That's not why I'm here. Go prove this philosophy in your own life. I took that very, very seriously because he understood it wasn't about the words, right? I mean, I, I'm, I'm a, I grew up Catholic what did we do? We recited the words over and over again. If you went to any type of religion that did that, you could still recite those words right now. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and I shall be healed. I mean, you could recite every single one 
of those prayers, those iterations that we spoke about over and over and over again. And he didn't want that. He wanted us to take this philosophy and get out there and prove it in our own lives because he knew the philosophy could handle that. And he truly believed if you were doing that, if you were practicing the philosophy, practicing the principles, practicing your spiritual practices, that you would always be a practitioner. Licensed spiritual practitioner is something the organization created as a path of study and all the reasons why. But you are a practitioner, and I hope you elevate your own thinking about yourself in this philosophy because that is, that is the truth. So he knew, go practice this. Go prove it for yourself. And I did just that. The other thing that's really interesting about Ernest Holmes is he didn't want to organize because of his religious upbringing. He was very, very concerned. For 10 years, 10 years, he resisted the people around him, encouraging him to organize the religion in a fashion similar to churches. And it took a particular argument that eventually caused him to yield. And the argument was, look, this thing is growing anyway. And if you organize it, you're going to have the opportunity to have some sort of dominion, some sort of control over how it grows and spreads. And that was important to him. And that is, why, that is one of the main reasons why um, he eventually yielded and organized and formed the uh, Church of Religious Science, which you know, led me to another book that I randomly opened. There is no random, right? And it says in this page that I opened, Ernest was not a churchman. I mean, you know, I'm sitting in my little room last night thinking, wow, this thing really is awake, aware, and alive. Like, it's talking directly to me. Yeah. This is total and pure evidence. Ernest was not a churchman. He was not seminary trained. And he did not really want a church. He liked lecturing in a theater. And before the theater, there were the living rooms, the all-powerful, almighty living rooms. That's where he started. Somebody invited him over. They started talking in someone's living room. And word got out, like it does when something's good, whether it's a movie or Ernest Holmes talking about metaphysics. Louise Hay started in a living room. And look what she grew. Michael Beckwith started in a living room. And now there's the Agape Center in Los Angeles. And that is why we call these spiritual centers. I mean, it took a long time in my experience and my observation for myself and others to let go of the church word. And sometimes we still use it and that's okay. But for me, it was important that it wasn't a church. It didn't have a cross with someone who was hanging from it. And that to me was what I needed. I needed something fresh and new. So the idea was these were centers and not per se churches. The other thing that's really interesting is that he, one time he went in, all on the same page here, and uh, somebody had adorned the, the platform with flowers, beautiful bouquet, and he said, get him out of here. I'm the attraction. Not in an ego-centered way, but knowing that distractions didn't help people be, be focused on the message. And the last thing he said about it all, which was really incredible, is he, you know, Ernest had strong ideas on how the Sunday service should be conducted. He says here, if I have done my job properly on the platform, the only appropriate thing for me to do at the end of my service is to disappear. Wow. If you had lifted people to sublime heights of spiritual realization, then standing around and chatting was not what you needed to do. That doesn't mean that our fellowship isn't beautiful, meaningful, and appropriate. It is. But it's just interesting to go back and just to hear how diehard he was about it all and how important it was for him that the message remained that which resonated in the people that attended. So for me, I wanted to just touch on some of the pillars that I think make this philosophy so unique and so important for us 
And just like Reverend Don said, you know, the Camino gave him a chance to revisit. You know, it's my hope today that we're revisiting some of these things and you're having a renewed relationship with your own experience with this philosophy. You know, we do have a lending library in the other room that's just chock full of all these books. You don't have to have them in your own home. You could just go and get one and binge some metaphysical books written by all sorts of incredible people. Prayer. So when I came into the philosophy, I was coming out of the Catholic upbringing, and in that upbringing, we prayed to something outside of ourselves. It was a man in, you know, the, in the clouds, so to speak, and you hoped he was in a good mood, right? And you hoped more than that, that you were worthy of your prayer being answered by by that God. So when I came into my spiritual education and my path here and I learned about spiritual mind treatment as a spiritual technology, what? What are you talking about? But over the course of many years and many classes, I came to learn about this thing we call spiritual mind treatment, which Karen talked about today and we talk about every single Sunday. But my relationship to prayer has changed dramatically over the years as well. Prayer and I had a massive separation when my mom was hospitalized in December of 2019 and then made her transition January 28, 2020. Why? Because my prayers were not answered. My prayers were not answered. And I thought, oh, this is a bunch of bunk, right? I understand you pray for the highest and best for everybody, but come on. How many people does it take to make Lazarus rise? That was just one person. I've got an army. Why didn't it happen? So I went through an appropriate crisis in my faith and my spiritual relationship to prayer. And now I do pray again. Um, at the time, I just let others pray for me, which is a good thing to do when you can't pray for yourself. That's why we're here for each other. I could still hear the word. I just had trouble believing it and saying it myself. And so why is it different for me today? Now I understand, okay, prayer is here to reorganize my thinking about whatever it is I'm dealing with. I'm less attached to the outcome of prayer, and I'm more concerned and, and intended to be about how my own thinking is being rearranged about the thing that may not change. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, yes to the parking lot, and yes to change, and yes to praying for outcomes for myself, but when it comes to other people or situations that have other people in it, my tendency these days is, how do I want to think about this? You know, how do I want to rearrange my thinking about this so that I can live in integrity, in congruence, and in peace with my own self? So that's one of my ma massive, you know, one of our pillars as well is affirmative prayer. The other thing that really rocked my world was the law of oneness. Like, I've been tuning into Gaia TV now because I'm just loving what they're saying and something deep within me is remembering everything that they're saying as something I've known for eons. And, you know, it's, it's a wonderful reminder that we're, bo we're born into this world in duality. Like the whole setup is come into, come into life and become something. Become a somebody. That's the whole focus. We separate and we set out to become somebody. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. However, what this philosophy helped me realize is that not only is there no body, but there's just one body. You know, not only have we spent our whole lives yearning for separation and, and this idea of me being a separate self, turns out what we're really yearning for is a return to our source while we're alive to experience that, right? So the law of oneness rocked my world, and I'm sure it rocks your world too. This idea that though you're sitting there, Claire, and I'm here, and we're clearly two separate expressions, that back behind the skin and bones is the one thing that created us. Like, wow, you know, yeah. Then you add family to the mix. <laughs> right? That's why we have classes, <laughs> right? <laughs> why we have practitioner sessions. <laughs> I need a little time to unpack this, and that's fine. So those things have to go through that as well, you know. Those whom we call our enemies have to go through that as well. It's a process. But that law of oneness, that truth, is very helpful to reconcile some of these challenges that we have these days. 
I remember my wonderful colleague uh, and prayer uh, partner, Kaleem, a couple of presidents ago, we were <laughs> challenged by the law of oneness. And that was a good thing, because we had to figure out how are we going to reconcile this based on principle. It took some time. Maybe it took you a little time as well. But that's the beauty of a principle. It just waits. It's not going anywhere. It's just going to stick around and be there for you for as long as you need it to be. And then the last thing, of course, is our teaching symbol. The great lesson that all students everywhere in the world should learn. I would love to stand on a street corner with a sign that says, seed, soil, plant, right? <laughs> Just have people come up and ask me what it is. Like that guy on all social media now that say, has a sign, come sing with me. And people are singing with him. And it's just incredibly how many talented people there are in the world. Seed, soil, plant. When I learned about seed, soil, plant, that was another game changer. Wow. That taught me the mystery of life, how it all is. The seed, still to this day. Who packed the rose in the bud? And who packed the bud in the seed? I mean, come on, seriously. We're all out there planting. We buy these seeds. Isn't that miraculous? That the little tiny seed holds the fullest expression of the thing that it is? Imagine if we thought that way about ourselves every day and took care of ourselves like we do our plants. The seed. Then the soil, wow, the soil has everything within it. It's like the womb that receives that seed and creates an environment for that seed to have the best chance that it can have to be the fullest expression that it is. And then the law, come on, seriously. How does that seed crack open? And what is pulling it? Or what is within it that's pushing? Maybe it's a pull push that is drawing that fragile little green stem through the density of the dirt until it pops up and, well, somewhere experiences sunlight and <laughs> grows to be its most magnificent self. And that's what that is. The seed goes into the soil and it comes up out as the plant. However, we live in a society in a world that oftentimes too many of us, myself included, not so much these days, but sometimes, thinks that the plant is the seed. Right? We think that conditions are the seed. We forget that back behind what we're experiencing, there was some environment that made it so, whether it's our own consciousness or the collective, and that there was some seed that was planted, whether by myself and or the collective that made it so. I mean, if you want daisies and you have rosy, roses, no matter how many times you implant those roses and move it around your garden, guess what you're still going to have? Roses. You're going to have to go back and get new seeds to get what it is you want now. And so those are some of the life-changing, ongoing, can withstand any test pillars that this philosophy gives us, not just 100 years ago, but today. That's remarkable that something that was birthed in a consciousness of men and women in 1926 is still working for us in 2023 as it will be in 2026. That's amazing. That's what we have at our fingertips with the science of mind and spirit. So I want to wrap up with this declaration of principles, because Ernest was a voracious reader. He read everybody. He read every book there is. He read it all, every religion. And then somehow he had the capacity to synthesize it into a declaration of truths that all these religions shared. You know, it's like we all, they all believed in the one. How they got to it was all very different, right? So I want to share with you the what we believe to close out my time with you today. So he wrote The Science of Mind and Spirit in 1926. I brought that copy a couple of talks ago. I don't believe it's in print anymore. It got seriously edited. And in that first edition, they had you know crystals and channeling and all of that because he was open to it. And it was going on at the time. So he included it and gave uh, respect to it. And then they said, oh, probably not. And so they edited all of that out in what we now know as the textbook. And then 
This is what he wrote shortly after that, and it was in the first Science of Mind magazine that was published the next year in 1927. And I'm going to say we believe, because that's how he wrote it, and I believe we have a pamphlet with this on it, go home and change out the I with we, and wow, you're going to have a vibrational frequency experience, because words have frequency power to them. We believe in God, the living spirit almighty, one indestructible, absolute, and self-existent cause. This one manifests itself in and through all creation, but is not absorbed by its creation. The manifest universe is the body of God. It is the logical and necessary outcome of the infinite self-knowingness of God. We believe in the incarnation of the Spirit in all people and that all people are incarnations of the one Spirit. We believe in the eternality, the immortality, and the continuity of the individual soul forever and ever expanding. We believe that the kingdom of heaven is within us and that we experience this kingdom to the degree that we become conscious of it. We believe the ultimate goal of life is to be a complete is we believe that we believe the ultimate goal of life to be a complete emancipation from all discord of every nature and that this goal is sure to be attained by all. We believe in the unity of life and that the highest God and the innermost God is one God. Wow. We believe that God is personal to all who feel this indwelling presence. We believe in the direct revelation of truth through the intuitive and spiritual nat nature of each person and that anyone may become a revealer of truth who lives in close contact with the indwelling God. We believe that the universal spirit, which is God, operates through a universal mind, which is the law of God, and that we are surrounded by this creative mind, which receives the direct impress of our thought and acts upon it. We believe in the healing of the sick through the power of this mind. We believe in the control of conditions through the power of this mind. We believe in the eternal goodness, the eternal loving kindness, and the eternal givingness of life to all. We believe in our soul, our own soul, our own spirit, our own destiny. For we understand that the life of all is God. So let's take a few deep breaths. Let's feel what's happening in the room right now. The transmutation that's happening because of the frequency of those words. The alchemy that is happening within us because of our willingness to receive and accept that truth as our own. Let us feel how it feels right now to feel that oneness in this room with each other and the amplification of the power that happens when we surrender to the unity that is in, through, and around us. And so together now, using your own mind, using your own heart, Let's collectively speak that word of truth. Ernest believed that 
You didn't have to always say it out loud. He believed that hearing that word in your own mind was as powerful as speaking it. So join me in utilizing, yes, your own mind right here and right now. We understand what we mean when we say it's already done, that we're living in an eternal presence that knows all because it is all, and that the realness of life cannot be seen, that the visible comes from the invisible, that the forms that we experience come from the formless, that this thing we speak about, speak to, and believe that we come up out of is awake, aware, alive, responding and responsive to each and every one of us in a language that we each understand because it is our own. That whether it is a grain of sand or a baby or a mountain, that back behind it is this one thing, this miraculous intelligence that is fueled by love, that knows all because it is all. It is the seed, it is the soil, it is the law, it is the plant, it is the thing itself. And we, we identify ourselves with that perfection right here and right now. We turn away from the conditions of our lives. We turn away from the headlines. We turn away from the broken leg, not denying it, but knowing that at some point we must turn away from the plant and turn back towards the seed if we want to experience a different plant, a different condition, a different outcome, that our mind is the soil, our thoughts the seed, our feelings, that vibrational frequency that activates the law that sets itself in motion without effort, cracks open that seed, draws forth the bloom and makes it so. We make more room in our thinking for that right here and right now. And I ask each and every one of you to put whatever relationship on the altar that needs to be altered by this love right now and have faith and trust that something beyond you is working out that on your behalf. To take the conditions of your life, the thinking of your life, entrenched in lack and separation and limitation, I gotta get mine because there's not enough. The whole not enoughness lie Put it on the altar today to be altered by the power and presence of love that has plenty for everyone, always has, always will. Let us replace our tiny little thimble with a wide open outreach. This, this, this container, this bucket that has no limit. Let us allow ourselves today to receive more than we've ever received before because finally we're throwing off the heavy cloak of unworthiness and saying no. In fact, saying yes, we are worthy, I am worthy to receive and I accept that good is pressing up against me and now I say yes and I allow it to pour itself through me so much so that it blesses everyone around me. Those who are experienced dis-ease or sickness, we respect that journey that they are going through. And yet on their behalf, we recognize that back behind the experience and the appearance of that, there is a prototype of perfection and wholeness. There is that original cause that we can dwell on on behalf of that person and ourselves and call it forth knowing that some intelligence is running all the functions of our being while we sit here in prayer. And for all of those who gave their lives for this thing we call our country and our freedoms, we have deep reverence and respect for you today. And for all of those who have given their lives for this philosophy so that it may grow and take root, not just in states and in this country, but across the world. And particularly to Ernest Holmes, who dedicated his entire consciousness to this thing so that I could stand here today in this way and know this truth with my family. For this and so much more, for the clothes on our back, the food in our cupboards, the money in our pocket, the gas in our cars, our cars, our friends, our job, our clarity of thought, for so much more we give thanks. Truly, gratitude. 
And like that seed, knowing that we have now created the perfect soil, we let it be. Like any good farmer, we've done what is ours to do and we walk away now knowing that something beyond us is cracking open this word, fulfilling it with the substance of life itself and bringing it about not just for us collectively, but individually as well. Oh, thank you, God. Thank you, Goddess. Thank you, Ernest Holmes, and to all those teachers who have come before us so that together we can say, and so it is.